Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of the Seekers Forum. I hope you're having a great weekend. And let us say hi to Jay Coakley. How are you, Jay? Hello, Mark. Doing great. Good to see everyone. Very great to see you. Welcome. So for those of you who are new to the Seekers Forum, let me just tell you what to expect today. I give a 20-minute talk during which you're invited to just sit back and relax. We turn off the visual so that you can you know, focus on what's being said. And then we come together for a 15-minute writing exercise, and then we open up the room to questions and answers and conversation. So this month, we're going to be talking about the interface uh, between science and spirituality, this marriage of the sense and soul, and how it is that we can integrate our spiritual lives and practice with the scientific worldview that dominates our secular culture. Science is the preeminent religion of our age, you could say. It's the domain that we look to, many of us, for answers to our most fundamental questions about where we came from, how we're created, and how we fit into the world around us. Now, science has given us a lot of wonderful gifts, of course. We've honed our ability to penetrate nature's mysteries, to optimize the powers of the natural world, extend our own lives to cure diseases, and to make life better in myriad ways. Science has also humbled us before the great unknowables of existence and the limits of our own knowledge. It's really impossible to look through the images sent back by the Webb telescope, for example, without dissolving in wonder and awe and humility, seeing the minute scale of who we are against the backdrop of the greater cosmos. Unfortunately, it is also true that science has increased our egotistical tendency as human beings toward arrogance, toward dominance, and the illusion of supremacy. Our extraordinary problem-solving abilities have also contributed to a tremendous superiority complex in our species. Science has helped to delude many people into believing that, for example, whatever damage we do to the planet You know, we'll figure it out. We'll we'll find a way to fix it. This arrogance tells us that we can reverse whatever destruction we wreak because we have a prefrontal cortex with analytical abilities and a near endless power of imagination. But this oversized belief in science really does have the potential of being the death knell for our species. When you look at atmospheric science, for example, and the facts that we're getting from people about changes to the planet. And then you hear on the other side, scientists and politicians talking about some proposal to get carbon emissions cut by 2035. You become aware of this gap, this game of chicken that we're playing with the environment. It's like a standoff between ourselves and the very creation that made us. In fact, it is a bargain with the devil that we may yet lose. The question is, in this arrogant scientific age of ours, What can the inner journey offer us, the spiritual journey offer us, to help us make sense of the outer chaos and uh, the scientific worldview with all of its contradictions from which much of this chaos has sprung? How can spirituality heal a scientific-minded culture that turns nature into a thing, an it, and deprives us of an essential connection that needs to be restored if we are to be saved? I heard a wonderful interview recently with a botanist named Robin Wall Kimmerer, whom you may have heard of. She's the author of a book called Braiding Sweetgrass. And she talks about how in her Native American understanding of the world, it's so different from how she was trained as a scientist. She talks about the grammar, for example, of how we describe ourselves in relation to the rest of creation. Kimmerer explains that in her culture, for example, beings of all different kinds are never referred to as it. She points out that it is the only pronoun that we have to describe everything in the natural world that isn't us, robbing it of character, robbing things of of their very being. This is what Kimmerer said. She said, quote, in the English language, we want to speak of that sugar maple or that salamander. The only grammar that we have to do so is to call those beings an it. Yet if I called my grandmother or the person sitting across the room from me an it, that would be so rude. We wouldn't tolerate that for members of our own species. 
But we not only tolerate it, it's the only way that we have in the English language to speak of other beings. She explains that in her native American language, which is Potawatomi, it's impossible to speak of other living beings as it. Instead, they are understood to be animate, living, sentient creatures, and as such to share the grammar that we use in regards to people. Kimmerer says that scientists are very eager not to personify elements in nature for fear of anthropomorphizing, giving nature a human face. She says, quote, when I talk about the personhood of all beings, plants included, it's not that I'm attributing human characteristics to them, not at all. I'm attributing plant characteristics to plant. I think it's also deeply disrespectful to say that they have no consciousness, no awareness, no beingness at all. Isn't that interesting? She also mentions that if you look at scientific studies of sentient beings for the past few decades, it's almost impossible to find a study that demonstrates that plants or animals are dumber than we thought. <laughs> she says it's always the opposite. What we're revealing is the fact that they have extraordinary capacities, which are so unlike our own. But we dismiss them because, well, they don't do it like animals do it. And if they don't do it like animals do it, then they must not be doing anything valuable at all. The science is showing us, though, that plants have a capacity to learn, to have memory. And we're at the edge of a, a wonderful revolution in understanding the sentience of other beings. So, in other words, the infusion of science with spirituality blurs the lines that science has created to categorize the world. There's also a fantastic book about this that I highly recommend. It's by a, a journalist named Lulu Miller, and it's called Why Fish Don't Exist. And I would write that down if I were you. It's a wonderful study using a guy from the 19th century who was a naturalist to show how our desire to categorize things, to turn everything into an it, divorces us from the creation. It divorces us spiritually from the world around us. So the point is that the scientific method, which is primarily aimed at understanding processes and how things work, necessarily objectifies the material world. It objectifies the material world in the process of studying it. It dissects and measures, compares, labels. And while this provides microscopic clarity and insight into nature, into the natural world, it also threatens to rob us of the big picture, the macrocosmic picture, the awareness of the holistic universe that defies our efforts to reduce it to digestible fragments and instead asserts its organismic wholeness instead. No matter how hard we try to chop and slice and dice reality into parts, uh, we can't do it. And as we see in crossover figures like Robin Wall Kimmerer, the seeker and the scientist actually share core values, even though their paths to attaining their ends use different tools and approaches in grammar. Like spiritual seekers, scientists are driven by the spirit of experimentation and the desire to illuminate the truth. Both seekers and scientists aim at peeling back the layers that conceal deeper knowledge and peering into its depths. Both seekers and scientists don't want to be fooled by appearances. We want to understand how reality actually works. Both science and spirituality are what could be called front seats to mystery. But in order to maintain balance within this mysterious whole, it's absolutely necessary that science remain in the service of spirituality and not vice versa. Otherwise, scientists risk mistaking themselves for God which can have, as we see around us, truly disastrous consequences. We forget who or what is in control when science is viewed as the true religion. We forget, as Ralph Waldo Emerson put it, that, quote, nature who made the mason made the house. Nature who made the mason, us, also made the house. We overlook the essential fact that human beings, with all of our scientific prowess, are never in control. We're never in control, nor should we be. And believing that we are in control does constitute a kind of sacrilege, even a form of self-idolatry. While we're able to study existence and make extraordinary advances in our knowledge, we do so only at the invitation, at the sufferance of a universe that we do not master, a universe that could at any moment, in fact, destroy us. 
And that's why scientists with mystical perspective, like Robin Wall Kimmerer, or like the physicist Frank Vilcek, or like Albert Einstein, father of them all, we realize that these people, these scientists, spiritual scientists, are at the tip of the ideological spear in terms of forming a view of the world as both scientifically explorable and knowable, as well as spiritually beyond our reach. Both are true. Einstein put it this way, quote, The finest emotion of which we are capable is the mystic emotion. Herein lies the germ of all art and all true science. Anyone to whom this feeling is alien, who is no longer capable of wonderment and lives in a state of fear, is a dead man. Let me just repeat that. The finest emotion, said Albert Einstein, of which we're capable is the mystic emotion. Herein lies the germ of all art and all true science. Anyone to whom this feeling is alien, who is no longer capable of wonderment and lives in a state of fear, is a dead man. Isn't that gorgeous? The French paleontologist, theologian Pierre Teilhard de Chardin referred to this marriage of sense and soul as the omega point. In this future state, Chardin suggests, the natural and supernatural worlds will be known to be one. Spirit will be understood to be a filament, uh, the hot wire that lights up the world, its essential energy source, you know, not something separate from it. It's only then that humankind is going to be equipped to evolve into what we're meant to be, which is divine beings in physical bodies and physical beings with a divine, a transcendent awareness, you know, moving through a material world, but looking through the eyes of God. The Indian sage Sri Aurobindo presented his own version of this spiritualizing process in what he called the integral yoga. When he speaks of calling down the light of God into the lives of mortal beings. Aurobindo wrote, quote, The yoga we practice is not for ourselves alone, but for the divine. Its aim is to work out the will of the divine in the world, to effect a spiritual transformation, and to bring down a divine nature and a divine life into the mental, vital, and physical nature and life of humanity. So there are many different grammars, many different languages for describing this confluence of science and spirituality, this confluence of the material and the spiritual. That is the edge that we live at today. So these are transformative visions. They're beautiful to contemplate, beautiful to work toward. But most of the time in everyday life, we live in a kind of in-between state, a dualistic condition where many of us may have glimpsed a different way of seeing, a different way of being through some spiritual experience or other, while at the same time struggling to understand it with our rational minds in scientific terms. And that leads to a dualistic, polarized mind state in which our minds are divided against themselves very often, unable to discern the underlying unity of apparent opposites. At our particular juncture of history, when scientific knowledge is at its zenith and the most sophisticated spiritual teachings are available to us online with the click of a mouse, this confusion has in fact never been greater. So it's incumbent on us, on all of us, in our own way, in our own practice, to use our powers of discernment to find a way through this war of the worldviews and to avail ourselves of the strengths of each one without imagining that they're interchangeable. This is an important point. There are tools that we use to study matter, and there are tools that we use to manifest spiritual presence. If you want to understand a block of stone, you take a hammer, you crack it open, and you study what you find inside. If you want to access your true transcendent nature, you turn within, you quiet down, you pull your senses from the outside world, and you train your attention on spiritual presence. You come to discover that there is a science to spiritual practice and that there is a spiritual approach to science. Rather than viewing the two as adversaries, we realize that they're more like different limbs on the same divine body, both of which animated, as all things are, by the one true being, the one true source. Now, as seekers, we come to realize that a big part of becoming wise is to know which tools to use and when in our various practices of being alive. And that brings us back to the marriage of sense and soul, 
just as every successful marriage benefits from parties knowing what each does best and what is beyond them, the same principle applies directly to the union of spirituality and science. There are circumstances in which we're much better served by being scientific, empirical, you know, just the facts, ma'am, when we're dealing with material challenges, for example. It's not helpful to be swept away into spiritualizing in ways that don't stand up to reason. And there are times when a transcendent approach is absolutely called for and necessary and appropriate. When we're far better off taking a spiritual outlook of unknowing, of receptivity, of openness to revelations from the invisible world. Because knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing. Even though we're rarely taught that in a secular culture that's based on scientific materialism. When it comes to matters of the heart, intuition, healing, We don't arrive at the truth by way of logic or reason or analytical thinking. Instead, we access the still small voice within only by not thinking, by quieting the mind and allowing the true self to make itself heard. But the voice of transcendental awareness, that witness consciousness in you, can't be heard through the racket of the ego. And that's because the ego itself is formed in large part as a way of closing off that transpersonal voice, of putting up limits between ourselves and the great beyond. The ego is all about staking out our individual space, you know, gaining some sense of autonomy, individuality, separation. It does this as a response to the fear of being nothing, the fear of being swallowed up into everything, the fear of not having an identity. And this is a necessary stage in human development. You know, we need an ego to navigate through the material world. That's inarguable. But it's not the final word on our evolution. The ego's limitations exist only in our minds. This person you call you is a bundle of thoughts, ideas, desires, fears, projections, clinging, and attachment to how you choose to identify yourself. So regardless of what your ego mind tells you, You are, in fact, never separate, autonomous, or demarcated from the rest of creation in any real or lasting way. Instead, you are a fluid, connected, nameless being, free of categories, free of tribes, and also free of bodies of knowledge that you use to understand your human condition, including science in its many, many forms. The true self that we share, the transcendental self, capital S, is eternal and unchanging, and it's perceivable only through transcendent awareness, which happens beyond reductive, controlling impulses of the rational mind. In the integral civilization of the future, spirituality and science will be wedded into a sacred union in which their respective strengths and limitations will be recognized. That is a hope where the impulse to merge into a faux singularity is resisted, and differences instead are respected and valued, so that, as in a good marriage, the strengths and limitations of each spouse are acknowledged and their contributions are honored. Then the disciplines of spirituality and science can be used with a full appreciation of what they share and what they don't share. And that clarity will teach us a lot about how we live our everyday lives. These are not abstractions. These ideas about science and spirituality, of of sense and soul, impact how we live. It impacts how we balance the different sides of our own psyche and how we use them in tandem, optimally, to awaken ourselves from ignorance. And that starts with examining where each of us falls on this spectrum between hard-headed materialist and skeptic to die-hard transcendentalist. We have to inquire seriously into how we see and what we believe to be true about reality. And that means exposing and exploring our own materialism and our beliefs about the relationship of physical existence and spiritual truth between science and soul. We need to ask ourselves, how do we relate to our bodies, for example, from the perspective of the transpersonal witness? How do we relate to our soul through the gateways of the physical senses? How do we know ourselves fully as homo duplex, the two-sided ape, with our feet on the ground and our eyes trained on the world beyond us? 
That's the fascinating duality of being human in in the non-dual world. The great existential psychologist Ernest Becker put it this way. He said, quote, the essence of man is really his paradoxical nature, the fact that he is half animal and half symbolic. And isn't it true? We are half animal and we are half symbolic. The animal half is the scientist. The animal half is the creature in search of solutions to its own material existence. The symbolic half, the spiritual part, with invisible imaginative powers, is the seeker in us that's in search of the source of our being. And we need both of these for a balanced life. One without the other makes for a very lopsided existence and a very lopsided world. And it's not surprising that our world is as polarized as it is, that there's so much fragmentation, social, ideological, scientific, spiritual. We see this reflected all around us, the fruits of this terrible imbalance. As Emerson put it, the reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited within himself. The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited within himself. So the question is, how do we create a detente in this war between opposing worldviews? That's what we're going to be looking at this month. How do we form what the mystics call the coincidentia oppositorum, the sacred marriage of opposites? between sense and soul that the mystic traditions speak about. We do do so by exploring a few questions that I'd like you to keep in mind, and we'll be talking about this throughout the month of September. The first is, uh, do we believe that our senses create reality? What do we believe about the relationship between our senses and reality? Next, we can look at whether we believe that humankind has the ability to figure out anything any kind of problem that we create in the universe. That's an important thing to contemplate. We may buy into that arrogance. And if we do, how do we contribute in ways that are unskillful and harm the planet? Next, do you believe that science is more trustworthy than spiritual teaching? What are your deepest feelings about this? What are your deepest intuitions about this? Do you believe that there is an invisible world beyond the ability of science to study? Perhaps you don't. And if you don't, that may be impacting your spiritual practice in in ways you're not aware of. And finally, do you privilege reason and deductive thinking over intuition? And if not, you know, how can you move toward a holistic view of spirit and matter that allows you to inhabit your body in a way that is not limited by the ego? And, And also understand the limitations of your knowledge so that surrender and humility are a part of your posture toward the world. So that's what I wanted to say to you today about science and spirituality, and let's do a little bit of writing. I'd like you to take 15 minutes, please, to write about when is skepticism your ally on the spiritual path, and when does it interfere with wisdom? When is skepticism a real ally to you, and when does it interfere with awakening, with revelation, with epiphany? We'll take 15 minutes to do that, please, and then we'll come back together as a group.